the only way to get word of mouth going in social media is to get people talking about you. And if you want to get people talking about you, they have to have your product in hand because they are content creators. They are willing to go to bat for you and, and take a photo or video and post it on their personal profile, which is actually asking a lot. Today, I am very excited to be joined by Neil Schaefer. If you don't know who Neil is, he is a fractional CMO, speaker, educator, and author of multiple books, including The Age of Influence. His fourth and newest book is Digital Threads, the small business entrepreneur playbook for digital first marketing. And his podcast is Your Digital Marketing Coach. Neil, welcome back to the show. It's been a little while. How are you doing today? Mike, doing awesome. It's just uh, it's such an honor to be here. Thank you very much for the invite. Well, it's great to have you back today. Neil and I are going to explore, are going to explore how user, how how um, really user generated content strategy works and all the benefits of it and all that fun stuff. Before we go there, it's been seven years. I've seen you in the last seven years, but it's been seven years since you've been on this show. So, kind of bring us up to speed on what's been going on with your business over the last seven years. Well, we had this thing called the pandemic, <laughs> right. which obviously uh, threw a wrench in all of our plans. But uh, since then, I think the last time I was on 2017, I was talking about influencer marketing, which I got deep into. And that led to me writing The Age of Influence, which came out at the perfect time two days before we went on lockdown here in California in 2020. Wow. Um, since. Yeah, since then, that, that period between 2017 and 2020, uh, I went from being a pure social media marketing strategy consultant to actually, at one point, launching an agency, which I no longer have. But on the other hand, uh, starting what became this fractional CMO thing that I do right now. And it started with working with a local client who bought into my social media marketing strategy. And they said, Neil, we love everything you're teaching us. We just need your help at implementing it. Will you join our team, come into our office like a half day a week, uh, report to the CEO and help our junior marketing team and our junior marketing manager really implement it and guide us in the implementation of the strategy? And that business model really came to life during 2020, 2021, when businesses were used to hiring people remotely uh, and they were looking for marketing expertise. I had a new book out on influencer marketing. And uh, yeah, they were, they were great years business-wise uh, for being a fractional CMO. And it's actually the experience that I had there that led to what I do today, which is not just social media marketing, not just influencer marketing, but really like social media examiner yourself, Mike, uh, you know, we, we handle everything digital marketing related because it's all, you know, you, you can't just stick at one aspect. You got to look at everything. And that led me to write digital threads based on you know, the experience of, and, and I had a, a pre-sales call today with a B2B company and they said, Neil, we want to do influencer marketing. Can you help us? And I said, well, let's take a step back. What are you trying to achieve with influencer marketing? What are you doing in your other digital channels? And is that really the best solution? It's, it's like going to the doctor and saying, you know, I think I have COVID. Can you give me some medicine without going through the routine of having a doctor examine you, ask you questions and find the perfect prescription? So that's the role that I really enjoy playing. And that's really what I do today as a fractional CMO and, and what the book is about. Well, I'm curious about the fractional CMO thing because there's a lot of um, our friends that have been doing this. And I'm just curious how that's... how. how how have you enjoyed doing that? I mean, obviously it sounds like it's a business model where you um, give a certain amount of your time to multiple businesses and you're kind of part of their team. It seems to be a very popular model and there might be people listening right now that are just curious how that's working for you. I really enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy the transparency. I love being part of a team. I like working at the, the strategic leadership level. And I think from the company perspective, it's very refreshing because when you work with an agency, sometimes you don't feel like you're in complete control. When you work with a consultant, it might be project-based. There's always somewhat of a black box, but when you work on an hourly basis, Right. And when the client is in full control of where those hours are spent, it, it's quite refreshing. And I think from the client perspective as well, the time that we spend together is becomes part of their intellectual property, right? Uh, depending on how they utilize a fraction of CMO. From my perspective, I've always thought variety is the spice of life. I love, I've, I've never niched into one specific industry. I, I feel comfortable in B2B and B2C and nonprofit for that matter. So I, I enjoy the variety of just helping a variety of businesses. And it's almost like you're playing a role-playing game. Your, your XP level, your experience level just goes up with every client. And I, you know, I, I teach as much as I learn myself. So uh, I, I enjoy the experience. And if, if someone's interested and, and wants to you know, find out more about it, I'd be more than happy to help anyone that's listening uh, on their journey. 
Thanks, Neil. Um, on to the book, Digital Threads. Uh, for folks that are listening today, um, the book may or may not be out by the time you're listening to it, right? So you are where are you at with the stage of the process of the book as people are listening to this uh, when this is launching in kind of late 2024? Yeah, so this is very much part of the, the creator economy of wanting to directly engage with my book buyer. So instead of going through a publisher, instead of thinking Amazon first, I'm thinking my my book readers first. So that's why I decided to actually launch this on Kickstarter. Not because I, I need the money to publish the book, which, which I don't, but it gives me an opportunity to really give those people that really want to read the book first exclusive access. Give people, if they want to buy a signed edition, the ability to do that. Uh, the ability for me to offer incentives, like buy a paperback, get a copy of the ebook for free. So that is currently in, in pre-launch mode. In other words, you can sign up uh, to get notified when it launches. I expect it's going to launch in July at some time. Uh, and I expect it will be on Amazon uh, August slash September. The book is done. I'm just working on the cover and the recording of the audiobook. So uh, yeah, hopefully by the time this is out, it will be available wherever you buy books. Very cool. All right. So user generated content. Um, let's kind of, there's a lot of marketers who may not even really understand what that is. So let's focus on kind of like, first of all, just give a brief definition of what it is because a user sounds like, you know, implies a certain kind of person. And then let's talk about like, what are the upsides to embracing user generated content? Sure. Well, if you think about social media, it really is comprised of two things. We have we have users, right? Everybody has a profile and everybody publishes content. So at the bare minimum, user-generated content is content that is published somewhere, normally on social media, by just an average day user. Now, why user-generated content has become so popular and the benefits, and, and we could look at this a few different ways, Mike. I mean, number one, when you go to the back cover of Digital Threads, you're going to see a few endorsements, and the number one endorsement is going to come from someone named Mike Steltzner. Now, Mike was kind enough to read my advanced reading copy, offer me a few sentences, but from my perspective, that is like a testimonial. And I could promote my book all that I want, but when Mike is promoting my book, it has a lot more weight right? This, com this comes down to like consumer psychology, user psychology, the psychology of influence, of social proof. So when someone else says something good about you, and this is why customer testimonials in marketing are extremely powerful. And if you think about it, like uh, this pre-sales call I had today, um, this is someone that has hundreds of customers, but they've never featured their customers on their website, for instance. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you have customer testimonials on your website. I think there's a lot of realtors and other small businesses that do this really well. Those are all types of user-generated content. And then with social media, we have people that are actually using your product. And for me, my journey to user-generated content is twofold. Number one, when I was finishing writing The Age of Influence, I realized that there is a value in having influencers promote your product on their channel, but there's also a value in the content that they create because content creators and influencers are really good at creating content. Wouldn't it be great if you could leverage their content for your channel, right? Uh, it's going to be a lot more convincing, a lot more persuasive, a lot more authentic because it's not you talking about your product. It's an actual social media user who may or may not be influential. It also gives a different perspective, uh, more diversity and what have you. So that's the, the number one way in which I got introduced to it as an extension and just a natural extension of influencer marketing, that the value of influencers is not just the amplification, but also the sheer content creation. The other thing, Mike, and I, I talk about this in digital threads because I think there's a natural order of things. I think every business starts out trying to become the media. And back in the days of LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, it was a lot easier. It was, it was mainly textual-based. Instagram came along, brands had to have this visual voice, and, and now it's all about short-form video, which makes it even harder for brands to create content that's really going to be seen in the algorithm. And there are some brands that do it really well, but I think it's a challenge for most brands. Well, user-generated content allows you to create less content yourself and tap into the voices of others to help feed not just your organic social media content, it could feed your paid social media content. And there's a few data studies that show that when you use user-generated content as part of your advertisements, they perform better than content that you create yourself. And we could take it one step further and actually use that user-generated content on our website. Uh, there is a great case study, a company called Revel Nail. And when they used user-generated content of actual Instagram users showing the nail colors on their nails 
on the shopping cart page, it led to a 2% decrease in abandoned sharp shopping cart rate, uh, which they calculate as estimated value of $400,000. So hmm. to me, user-generated content ties together a lot of these digital threads because it could be leveraged on any one of your digital channels. So those are you know, some of, I think, the big benefits uh, that are attractive to uh, those companies that they want to get off the hamster wheel content. They want to improve their advertising, social media advertising ROI. They want to engage with content creators. Um, they want to get access to better content that is going to help promote what they do in a better way. Yeah, it's kind of intriguing as I'm listening to you and I start thinking about the struggle that many marketing departments face, which is that they don't maybe have someone in house that's really, really good at creating reels and TikToks or photography or any of the kind of cool stuff that a lot of people instinctively do uh, on social media. And the benefit of being able to um, access that, leverage that, and um, boost or enhance that, right? And it gives, you know, obviously, I'm sure many times the people that create the content love the fact that the brand behind it get, has, has reshared their content or whatever, right? And um, I do think that you're right. I mean, like the the benefit of the social proof and the authenticity and these trust signals and all these kind of things are really, really valuable for marketers. And I think a lot of marketers just when they see that stuff, they leave a comment and they move along, right? They, they say, thank you so much for sharing our stuff, but they don't really do what we're going to be talking about. So if people want to um, actually get started with user generated content, what are some of the first things that we ought to consider? So I think the first thing is, is mindset. And in the book, I bring up Disneyland and mm. I bring up Disneyland and it's an old case study, but when they launched their Instagram channel, I think back in 2013 and Disney is one of the most iconic brands, but they decided at that point that they could not compete with the sheer volume, variety, and authenticity of just the user-generated content that people were, were creating around their Disneyland trips, right? So they decided at the beginning to become 100% user-generated content. And I think mm. if you start with that in mind, and yes, I, I get that sometimes you have promos, sometimes there's, there's certain things that you want to talk about that it needs to come from you, and that's okay. But for most of the content, if you can think in that way, I, I think that's really step one. Step two it becomes a little bit harder, but the best way, it's like the best way to get traffic is organically instead of having to pay for it. And therefore, the best way to get user-generated content as well is organically. And there's a few things you could do. Obviously, what most brands will do is they'll put a hashtag on their Instagram bio, you know, make sure you use our hashtag so we can feature you when, you know, in our posts, uh, you know, put your hashtag on, on the packaging, on your website, remind people of it all the time. But I, I think the other thing that's really important is, and I like to call this, you know, how Instagrammable is your customer experience. And if you are a retail store or, you know, a hotel or restaurant, it's a lot easier to create these corners. And if you run an event like Social Media Marketing World, it's really easy to create these areas where people will naturally want to take selfies, or they'll naturally want to take a photo to commemorate uh, where they went. And the example I like to give here is a, a cosmetics brand that's very popular on, on TikTok and Instagram with Gen Z and millennials called Glossier. And if you were to go to one of their flagship stores, I think they only have 10 in the United States, but they have a big one here in Los Angeles on Melrose Avenue. And I mean, just do a search for the hashtag Glossier, and you'll see people you know, taking selfies outside the store, inside the store, without even mentioning the fact that they provide you know, cosmetics um, because it, they have created this Instagrammable experience for that generation of user. And that's really the ultimate. If you're a B2B brand, it might be a little bit you know, harder, but with B2B brands, it's also, do you send you know, personalized emails uh, you know, featuring your customers in videos? There's, you need to be a little bit more creative, sending you know, swag after they become a customer or after being a loyal customer for a year, sending them a t-shirt, thanking them. A lot of different things you can do, and hopefully they'll, they'll take pictures of themselves you know, in, in that t-shirt or what have you. But it's really, you know, how do we organically get people to talk about us on social media in a visual way um, so that our brand is featured organically and then we can tap into that as additional user-generated content that we can use? 
It's funny. I'm going to date myself, but I remember going to Disneyland and they would have these little signs that say Kodak moment. Do you remember this, Neil, when you go to Disneyland yes. and they were in key locations? And the idea was it was designed to be a good spot where you can take a picture um, and obviously get it developed later back when Kodak was making film and stuff like that. Right. So Disneyland in general has always understood that there is memories that are being made if you and, and just put in the sign there uh, that says Kodak moment. Uh, Kodak obviously paid for that spot, but it just encouraged people to actually get their photos there. And then occasionally they would have professional photographers there and they would try to sell you the pictures and stuff. So, you know, what I love about what you're saying, and I see this, and you and I were talking about this when we were prepping for the interview. I see it when I go to these little strip malls where they've got a bunch of restaurants. I'll notice that there are um, sometimes outside the restaurant, sometimes in the back corner of the restaurant, there's these spaces that are clearly attractive and well lit that are designed for some purpose that may not be obvious at first, but they're designed for people to take selfies in, right? And, or to get a small group together and take a picture in there. And that's the kind of stuff that almost instinctively is what I'm hearing you say becomes an Instagrammable moment, right? And if it's not there and it's not obvious, people aren't going to necessarily think to do it. Absolutely. And that's why I started with the mindset and the strategy is you need to sort of plan this out. It doesn't happen overnight, but how can you include something Instagrammable at every touch point of the customer experience? And right. that is one, like I said, if you're retail, uh, physical place, that's a lot easier to do, but it can be done uh, B2B or, or, you know, e-commerce, what have you. And even with packaged goods, I think that there's something that can be said there. Um, and I see a lot of these unboxing videos and I don't know if they're still popular, Neil, or not, but um, this is, I know we're kind of getting in probably to the next question, but, and I'll just transition right into the next question, which is, all right, so, let, well, actually, yeah, let's just say we don't have, let, before I get into the next question, let's just say we don't, we don't have any Instagrammable moment. Um What in the world do we do? Cause I'm guessing a lot of people don't have this, you know what I mean? Like, Let's just ideate real quick on the fly before we go to the next question. Like if you were working with a client and you were trying to advise them and they say, no, we don't really have any Instagrammable moment. Let's just get creative a little bit here. What could we do to create an Instagrammable moment? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think the, uh, the Instagrammable moment is really about a, a customer or potential customer experiencing your brand. Hmm. So if you don't have that, and if you don't have customers, let's be really extreme here. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a matter of, and this this gets back to the age of influence and how you start with influencer marketing if you're a startup, is you have to seed word of mouth. The only way to get word of mouth going in social media is to get people talking about you. And if you want to get people talking about you, they have to have your product in hand. And this is where we get into influencer gifting, which has become very popular of literally seeding the market, finding people that you know talk to the communities that, that you want to be in front of um, and enticing them with your product to you know, in, in exchange for free product of actually creating that content that they'll either share on their social media channel and, or they will provide back to you that you can share as well. And, and as you said, Mike, you know, when a brand reposts your content and tags you, it's very powerful and it makes you want to talk more about that brand. It's sort of human nature. I'll never forget when I was at a California pizza kitchen with my family and I put up a story of the Sangria flight, which is our big, uh, my wife's and I big favorite. Um, and I, you know, I tagged California pizza kitchen. They like reposted that. Right. Mm -hmm. And that encourages me next time I, I go, I'm going to post something else and tag them and see what happens. So, so yeah, I think, you know, you need to start it somehow. And that would be the way that I would get started. And obviously there are other ways. I think that um, it's interesting that user generated content has become so big that there's actually an industry uh, around it. And there's actually a person that might not be an influencer, but they're really, really good at content creation. They're called UGC creators. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were to do a search on LinkedIn or Instagram, hashtag UGC creator, or if you go to Fiverr or Upwork, you will find a lot of people that for a small price uh, we'll record a 15 second video uh, featuring your product. I actually did this as an experiment, Mike. I was telling you about it. I have a free LinkedIn ebook and I hired someone on Fiverr. I think it was $60 for a 15 second uh, TikTok video. And it, it was virtual. I just sent them an image of what the book looked like, that the PDF cover. And they put together a pretty compelling 
uh, 15 second video that I plan on using in an upcoming advertisement campaign to see how it goes. But it, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And ideally, if you can get your own customers to talk about you uh, without having to pay that just through product is great. The other very, very popular way, Mike, and I'll stop at this third one is the idea of sort of a contest or giveaway. That now, we, before you go there, before you yeah. go there, I just want to, I just want to share a couple thoughts. Um, so first of all, um, one of the things that came to my mind when you were speaking, Neil, was um, a lot of our friends that publish books, and you've, you've experienced this, they'll mail a little kit to a number of influential people. And inside the kit might be a box with a little cookie in it, and it might have some chotskis in it, and it might be in a nice big box with some of that fluffy stuff that people put inside of gifts, and then the book is in there, right? So um, what I what I see there is it creates an experience the moment you open the box. And sometimes these boxes have printing on the inside of them and they were clearly made for that influential person. And I think the signal that that sends to the, and, and this is back to the influencer gifting thing, um, is like there's stuff here that I could take a selfie with or there's stuff here that I could take pictures of. And I think it will increase the likelihood if you're doing the influencer gifting that you might get that person to pull that book out, take a selfie with it, and maybe with all the other stuff behind and, and post it up on the social, which is exactly what you want. So, um, so you've already kind of rolled into uh, my next question, which is how do we get people to actually generate content that are maybe customers, right? And you're about to talk about contests and giveaways. So keep going. Yeah. And, and that, uh, what you just talked about, Mike, I'm, I'm remembering Jay Bear. And I think it was his book, Talk Triggers, where he sent out llama stuffed animals. There you um, go. That's right. Right. I think it was during COVID. I, I posted a picture myself, right? So yeah, that's it, exactly. That's, it, it doesn't have to be your product per se. It can be something else that people will want to take or, pictures Or of. a package with your product in the middle of it, right? Exactly. And then taking advantage of that unboxing, you know, depending right. on how you package that. But, but yeah, I mean, contests and giveaways are, are a great way to do this as well. Giving away, Hey, we'll give you, you know, X hundred dollars worth of product or, you know, 10 winners of a $50 Amazon gift card, whatever it is, and getting people to want to create user generated content with something that's relevant to your brand. So you need to make it uh, fun that, you know, people would actually want to do it. And it obviously has to have some relevance. You don't want to go back to the days where people were giving away iPads to get Facebook likes. And then it's like, okay, we have all these Facebook likes and they have a free iPad and they don't know what we do for, for a business and they're not our, in our target market. So it's all about relevance. Um, you know, I think one of the classic uh, case studies of a giveaway is uh, a brand called iLips Face. They're called ELF Cosmetics. And this is like very, very hard to do, but they were actually able to create a song um, and basically they said, Hey, we're, we're giving away product. And did you know that ELF cosmetics stands for eyes, lips, face? So we want you to create basically, uh, you know, lip sync this song showing off your beautiful eyes, your beautiful lips, your beautiful face. And the song itself, they, they commissioned someone to create the song. It ended up going viral. Um, the, the people that recorded the video, it was very much in line with, with TikTok trends of sort of lip syncing, um, talking about your eyes, lips, mouth. I think it got like something crazy, like 10 billion views. Um, wow. but, yeah. And th that's, that's very, very hard for a small business to create a song that, that goes viral on TikTok. But, you know, other big brands, uh, you know, Lululemon, um, it's a sweat life. Like, hey, take a picture of yourself, you know, sweating in your authentic way. Um, that ended up having like, a, you know, tens of thousands of entries and it ended up uh, creating its own community. So I think that's really a great way to think about it is how can we have a hashtag that is relevant to our brand and our, our community? How can we, how can we actually create a community from it, right? Create a giveaway that gets people involved, like a, you know, a 30 day challenge uh, is another popular one. Take a picture day one, day 30, did you meet your goals? Um, but it, it has to in some way be relevant to the brand. So okay, real quick, yeah. I, want, I want to dig in on a couple of these. Um, back to the contests. Um, I believe it was when I launched my second book launch, I did a photo contest where I encouraged people to take the word launch and take a picture and just get creative with it. And I had all, and, and the prize was that they were going to win like an hour with me in a, in a free consultation and they were going to win um, like a signed copy of the book. And I remember um, the winners were uh, goat milk stuff. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of these guys, but they, they had a bunch of goats in front of them and then they had their family each holding up like a little card that said L-A-U-N-C-H. I had Dennis 
doing weird stuff with people's mouths open. I, I had all these different people doing all these cool things and I was sharing all the images out on social media. And then I was encouraging people to vote on their favorite, right? And I encouraged the actual participants to try to help get the word out. And what that ended up doing was it created a lot of uh, sharing and a lot of discussion and it was all around the word launch, but it, it didn't necessarily in this case, um, it wasn't obvious that this was my book, but mm -hmm. it was going to my website, you know, socialmediaexaminer.com where all that stuff lived. And it created a lot of kind of buzz. And um, I found that if you do video and I've tried video contests in the, in the past, it's really at least back in the day, it was really hard to get people to do video. Nowadays, it's probably a lot easier because everybody can do it with their phone. But um, I'm curious, what was Lululemon? Did you get a chance to participate in that or see that? Like, do you know anything more about the sweat life thing, what, what they were doing there? I mean, I, I did not participate in it myself. And I think it's really that they already tapped into a very active community right. uh, that they just they just needed a reason and excuse to activate them to do something else. So that right. it, it's very, very easy. The more established your brand is, it's like Instagram creating a whole new social network when you already have like a billion users. It's easy to launch with 200 million users. Yep. So I, if, you're, if you're a startup or you don't have that big of a following or that many customers, it becomes a little bit harder, but it's all about constructing in a way so that it, it talks about your brand, but it taps into you know a community need. And there's also maybe something fun about it if you're going for that very young generation on TikTok. So just so we're clear when we're doing like, cause I think the easiest things to do thing to, and I've seen this with book authors where they've encouraged people to take the book to the most weirdest place and take pictures. And I think it was David Merman Scott's one of his books or something, but you know, you see people on the top of mountains and like in these weird locations with these books, you know what I mean? And, and um, I'm just curious, like, is the objective here just to get people to take a lot of pictures and include a hashtag or is the objective here to actually interact with the people that are creating this content when it comes to contests and giveaways and, and somehow get that content onto your social platform. I just like to pause and get your thoughts on that a little bit. Yeah, I think ideally, and I think book is a very unique one, but ideally you want to have content created that would be worthy to, that you would want to post on your own profile. Right. So you mentioned, you know, your launch campaign, uh, you know, what Jay did with talk triggers was he actually sent out the book with the stuffed animal. And I think his instructions were, if you're going to take a picture, please make sure you include the book together with the stuffed animal. Right. right. So I, I, I do think that it has to serve your purpose as well. So ideally you want to create a, a contest where people post things in a way that would encourage other people to want to, you know, check out what you do or potentially buy your product. And if you did that for the books, then that's awesome, right? But I think intrigue alone may not be enough and you want to be a little bit more practical. Right. Uh, but ideally, you know, it, it, in digital threads, I, I talk about that, you know, the challenges, the hamster wheel of content and how user-generated content when done right can, can help solve that. And obviously contests are just one of, of many other things you can do, as I mentioned. But I think at the end, it's really you know, continuing that relationship and ideally driving uh, those people that you engage with and, and hopefully creating some sort of deeper relationship with them because they are content creators. They are willing to go to bat for you and, and take a photo or video and post it on their personal profile, which is actually asking a lot. And if they really enjoy your product or your book, then hopefully they'll want to take the next step. And that to me is the establishment of a more formal community where you can activate user-generated content on a more regular basis. We we often call those communities brand ambassador communities, but that to me is really the ultimate. That's where we begin to get more into the influencer marketing of having an army of people that will want to talk about us on a regular basis. So I want to get back to that, but there's a few things that I want to, I want to dig in on. Uh, earlier, you mentioned hiring creators and we also mentioned hashtags. So I want to go a little deeper on each of these. On the hashtag side of things, um, do you think that just strategically placing a hashtag, let's say it's a business to consumer physical product, right? Do you think just putting the hashtag on the packaging alone or um, on the container or the bottle or whatever it is would be enough of a trigger for someone to think? Like, for example, quite literally today, I installed a frame, Samsung frame TV over my fireplace, okay? And I didn't notice any hashtags anywhere, but 
it would be really cool if Samsung, like, because these TVs look like art when they're up on the wall, right? Mm. If they somehow encourage some sort of like Samsung art or something like that, or Samsung frame TV art or something like that with a hashtag, I might have taken a selfie with it. I don't know if I would or wouldn't, but I might have. And I think it would have increased the likelihood that I would have done so. So I'm just curious, in your professional opinion, um, how ought we use hashtags, especially if it's like a B2C product or even a B2B product, just to encourage people subtly to create that content and also to make it so we can discover it? Great question. I, I think that every physical product should have a hashtag somewhere. And I, I think just, you know, brand name hashtag isn't enough. It has to be a hashtag that is memorable, that is somewhat cool. Sometimes a play on words can work. I don't, I don't have any like on the top of my mind right now. Yeah. Um, but, but, but you definitely want to think creatively about it. Do you create a different hashtag per product is another story. But I mean, I would take it one step further and say, hey, you know, check out our gallery of happy Samsung customers. Do you want to get featured here? Make sure you upload a photo. There of you go. What, of what your Samsung frame looks like. And guess so a, what? A CTA. Once a, I love that. That's that's great. Yeah, keep going. And once a, once a month, we're going to give away, you know, $1,000 Samsung gift certificate. Or every year we give away a, a paid round trip ticket to Samsung headquarters in Seoul. So you mix in a few different things there, right? And when they go to your social profile, they see, oh, we feature our customers. Want to be featured here? Buy one of our products, use the hashtag. So you want to create like this flywheel, right? Um, of everything we talked about, of, you know, reminding people to use the hashtag putting it on your profile, sharing that content, having a contest. And that to me would be the ultimate way to continue to organically with every new customer. You may not convert 100%, but even if you convert a small percentage, that can be a lot of content that now you can be reposting on your sites. Um, you, we talked about when we were in preparation, this, this Australia travel example, does that ring any bells to you? Yeah. So there is a, a, a travel consultant and she reached out to me. I, I did a podcast episode on user generated content. And she's like, oh, you know, that that's basically all that she does. And she lives in a very, very small town in Australia. And she basically uh, manages two different uh, Instagram accounts for these two very, very small towns in Australia. They're beach towns. They're basically like tourism bureau accounts. Mm -hmm. And basically with each account, she promotes, hey, make sure you use this hashtag. And the accounts are pretty much 100% user-generated content, uh, published content. And it, it creates this flywheel where other people want to use that same hashtag to get featured. And of the two accounts combined, the population of these, these Australian towns is like 22,000 people. But she uh, actually has already generated more than 16,000 combined instances of hashtag generation uh, just from this whole campaign or, or strategy of reminding people to use the hashtag when publishing and then actually sharing that content on their channel using those same hashtags. So uh, Ooh, you don't have I love to this. I love this, Neil, because I'm thinking to myself, anybody who has any kind of experience as a physical outdoor or even indoor experience could simply put up a little sign. Like imagine you are working for a city and you work with the tourism department of that city. Why not, why not have a little um, welcome to the city and then underneath it, you know, uh, hashtag, you know, put the hashtag right there. Or if there's certain spots, you know, everybody takes pictures, right? Um, put up a little sign that just says, uh, share your experience. And then with the hashtag underneath it. And I would imagine that little subtle CTA could make a huge difference, right? Yeah. Imagine if you, if you land at San Diego airport, and they have a big sign with hashtag only in San Diego, for instance. There I'm you just go. It up. That's the type of hashtag. And then guess what? Well, the city of San Diego has, you know, 100,000 followers. So to a lot of people, that'd be really attractive if they, were got, if they got featured on that. So right. here's the thing. The more influential your brand is, the easier it is to generate the user-generated content because more and more people want to be part of, of, of your channel. Hiring these creators, these user-generated creators, um, you kind of uh, early in the interview mentioned um, if somebody wanted to try to find somebody that does this, what should they be looking for? Yeah, well, there are, there are agencies. Uh, I think even influencer marketing agencies these days will will do this uh, as part of what they offer. There are marketplaces that just focus on this, and then there are the the actual freelancers. So, for me, you know, when I went on to Fiverr, there were like ten different UGC creators that uh, that interested me. And what's really cool is, you know, did you search UGC creator or what did you search exactly? I searched UGC creator exactly, and it, oh, it, it okay. Is it has become that popular, especially for e-commerce. And there's a lot of data that says that the average consumer 
actually wants more user-generated content. And when they see it on the website, they are immediately attracted to it and they'll start digging through it and they want more and more, right? So I think a lot of smart, savvy e-commerce brands are really investing in this. And what's really cool, Mike, it's almost like the first time you use ChatGPT and you go, give me 10 titles for this podcast episode. And it comes up with things that you probably never thought about, right? This diversity. And I, I look at UGC the same because just like your launch campaign, Mike, people thought of launch in extremely different ways, right? Because we're all different. We're, we're all wired differently. Right. And this is what can bring diversity to your feed and the way that your, your product's exposed. So I looked at the content. These UGC creators all had samples of their content that they had done for other brands. Mm. So there was a gentleman, I guess, like in his 50s, and he always did these videos while he was in the shower. Okay, he's like a handyman. Okay. And it, so that is a particular vibe that would attract a, you know, an audience. There was a husband and wife couple in their 40s. There was someone with a Texan accent, female in her 30s, right? Uh, so you can basically choose the vibe that you think would attract your target audience based on these people, not their followers, but how they present themselves on camera. So I decided to choose someone. She's based in London. She's actually from Latvia. She has like orange hair, um, but she talked in a very professional way. And I thought she had this real cool entrepreneurial, you know, late 20s vibe that would really uh, resonate with where I wanted to, uh, th the type of demographic that I wanted to attract. So that's the beautiful thing about working with UGC creators is that you can sort of, especially if you want to do a video that features a person, if you're just doing a flat lay photo on Instagram, you want to see their, their past work on that as well. But you can really pick and choose the type of person that will attract the type of people you want to attract. And you could hire four different UGC creators that, that attract four different audiences and see which content does better. You can do a lot of A-B testing across you know, ethnicity, gender, whatever you want to do, accents. So I, I think once you get started, it's actually quite, uh, quite fascinating. And there's a lot of things you can experiment with to try to optimize your UGC efforts. This is intriguing because... In this case, they're giving you the, the video file. They're not posting it for you, right? And you're using it Correct. for whatever purpose you want. Correct. What kind of, uh, do you have to give them scripts or do you generally give them talking points or do they do multiple iterations? I'm just curious how that works. The golden rule of influencer marketing is is you're, you're collaborating with content creators that are that are better at what they do than you are, right? Yeah. So the idea is you want to give them creative freedom. I, I gave this person complete creative freedom. All I said was, here's the visual. I want, th I want you to have them download this. I'm targeting entrepreneurs and small businesses, and I let them create the script. Obviously, uh, with Fiverr, you want to choose someone that allows you to make revisions, yeah. um, one, two, three revisions. So there was one revision that was made, but pretty much she nailed it. And I really enjoyed uh, this different perspective that I would have never been able to talk about myself. So they so, provide yeah. the scripts and then they make the video. Is that generally how it works? Yeah, I mean, you can provide them a script. I don't know if it's going to perform as better. It's it's always but authentic. Did, did they if, give you a script or did they just take a wing at it and said, what, what do you think? They just hit record? I think she asked me if I wanted to see the script and I said I was very comfortable with, with however they wanted to position it. So I, cool. I think, Mike... You know, here's the thing, like if you think of user-generated content to re replace your own content, that's going to be a lot of content. Yeah. And if you're overly micromanaging on a one-by-one -one basis, yeah. um, that's going to eat up a lot of time, especially if you're a small business or a marketer wearing a lot of hats. So yeah. I think giving creative freedom and, and you may find out of working with five people, like two or three did it really well and two didn't do it so well. So the next time you work with those three people, right? Um, but that would be my approach at least. Very cool. Okay. So, um, we've, so far we've talked about a lot of different examples of, the, of ways you can encourage people to create content that you could reuse on, on your website. Uh, I mean, I'm not on your, well, everywhere, frankly. Um, but you talk, you started talking about if you want to take it to the next level, um, you ought to consider a brand ambassador program. So first of all, what is a brand ambassador program? And maybe you can give us some examples. Yeah, so a brand ambassador program is really bringing together people that are fans of your brand. Ideally, they're customers. Uh, there are big brands that have employee brand ambassador programs, but it's really, you know, scaling these relationships from a one to one to a one to many. So imagine you started with the hamster wheel of content creation. You tapped into user generated content. You really enjoy working with some creators like that you'd like to have a regular relationship with. And maybe they also fell in love with your product and you've converted them into becoming a brand advocate. The next step is really to have some sort of a formal program where you can bring all these people together, maybe on a, on a seasonal or a monthly basis, have different themes 
of content that you'd like to get created or contests that you'd like help getting promoted or maybe events that you'd like their help, um, you know, being at to cover as a photographer, as a videographer. So I think it's a very, very powerful thing that requires you to really convert the community that you have online, the community of your customers, of your employees into something that will bring them together in, in an environment that makes it easy for them to promote your brand. And, you know, a few different examples I can give here. One favorite I have is this company that reached out to me. They're, they're a big European consumer packaged goods company. And I was at their APAC headquarters in Singapore. And they were saying, you know, Neil, we have a lot of, you know, nano and very, very small follower count influencers that are very passionate about the brand. You know, they post a lot about the brand whenever they have like a new product coming out. But maybe some of them are not the best copywriters. Maybe some of them are not the best photographers or the best videographers. And he said, you know, Neil, what do you think of us bringing in other influencers to train these people, these brand ambassadors that are already talking about us to become better photographers, to become better videographers, maybe personal branding advice, right? And I think that it is a great real role model that any brand can do. And I'd like to say that, you know, when working with influencers or content creators, if you have this sort of community where you're giving out, you know, free store credits every month, or you're giving them opportunities like, hey, um, we're renting a video studio in New York City next month. And anybody that wants to, you know, that wants to record during a day there, or hey, we have a photographer in town. Uh, she has uh, you know, a few hours open. We've already paid for her. We'd like to take you out on a photo shoot if you're in town. There's all these things that brands can offer, right? Uh, the content creators and influencers, especially those that are in their brand ambassador community to really uh, get people talking about you, get people more active to, to want to talk about you, building more of an emotional relationship with you. And one that I detail in Digital Threads that I'm personally part of is the Adobe Express brand ambassador community. And for Adobe, obviously, they're competing with a very, very large company out of Australia, beginning with the letter C, uh, going after that same market. But for them, it was really about having not just people that are, are creative professionals that are passionate about what they do in their community, but also you know, from a product perspective, asking these creative people, what do you want to see in our product? And I think the greatest ROI, you know, from the events I went to uh, is the actual product feedback that they got on a regular basis of what features should they have? How do, how do they improve the product? Which is amazing ROI if you think about it. Obviously, you know, Adobe also invested in, in flying people around the world to their event in Los Angeles the last two years, Adobe Max. Um, it was not cheap, but in terms of the amount of, of content that was published, in terms of the amount of social interactions and the product feedback, they've just had immense ROI from it. So um, there are regular challenges that they have in the community. Um, you know, I uh, was interviewed on another community members podcast. There's been a lot of collaborations between community members at community events They'll have you know other community members talk about their specialty, like you know brand design or whatever it might be. So it, it they've really built that you know the true community is one where the brand is not doing the talking, but it's the community doing the talking with each other, and the brand is always the center of the conversation. And it's just one of the greatest examples. And and I think any you know brand, it, whether you have five customers or fifty or a hundred, if you can just start with a small group of customers, you can get together even virtually on a regular basis and start there. I think that can be a powerful vehicle not just for user-generated content, but really for, for product feedback, for a lot of other things um, and, and a lot of other benefits that can benefit your brand. You know, I think about all these um, uh, video-based companies. There's a lot of them, like I think TubeBuddy and StreamYard and others have had amb ambassador programs. Um, are these typically paid programs or, or are they just the perks are so high that people are willing to do it for free? I'm just, just so people, if they're thinking about building a brand ambassador program. It is actually a combination, right? So, and this is like influencer marketing in general and brand ambassador communities are the same. It's the wild west. Why, what is the incentive for someone to join? So you can go to a lot of e-commerce websites. And if you go to the bottom footer, there might be like brand ambassador, uh, a link to apply to their brand ambassador community. So you can actually look for some of these and see the benefits that they offer. Generally, if you're offering like loyalty rewards, then they would offer loyalty rewards. But what, what does that mean? What does loyalty rewards mean? So for instance, um, if you've been a customer for over X months or X years, or if you purchase X dollars, you know, a year, then you get 5% off, 10% off, you get points that uh, you can convert into free product. So I think generally the way these work is they give some sort of discount on product. Um, maybe they give some free product, exclusive access, you know, early bird access when they have new products. Um, and uh, they often have an affiliate 
tied to it where people can make a commission uh, mm-hmm. in addition to you know promoting the product on brand uh, online. So it's usually a combination of things. Um, there are some communities that are a little bit more aggressive and they will pay people on a monthly basis to join the community. Um, I think what a lot of communities do now, though, is they will look at their most successful members and maybe they have an additional tier mm-hmm. that says, okay, we really we really uh, appreciate your participation and we'd like to accelerate it. Can we you know, give you somewhat of a monthly stipend so that on a monthly basis, you'll be producing content for us? And that's really where the, the money might come into play. But before that, it's always product, discount, exclusive opportunity, what have you. Neil, this has really been a fascinating discussion of um, all different angles of user-generated content strategy. I know that um, there's going to be some people that want to connect with you. So first, what's your preferred social platform? And secondly, uh, where do you want to send people if they want to discover more about working with you and or checking out your 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 new book? Sure. Uh, I'd say connect with me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash in slash Neil Schaefer, N-E-A-L-S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R. My website is also neilschafer.com. And if you want to find out more about digital threads, go to neilschafer.com slash Kickstarter, which will forward to wherever the book is being sold at the time. Neil, thank you so much for answering all my questions today and providing a lot of wisdom to our audience. My pleasure, Mike.